<clears throat> Maybe I shouldn't get too close to him after I had that garlic bread. <laughs> We welcome you tonight. If you're visiting with us, we're so thankful for your presence, and we have guests among us. Thank you for encouraging us. That just means so much, and, and uh, just to be able to be with Christians at the end of a beautiful day, and to be able to sing, and uh, praise God, and pray to Him, and just, just enjoy the times that we have together uh, as, uh, as, as, as family, and that's really what Christians are. We are we are family, and it's always interesting wherever you go in this country and sometimes around the world, you don't have to run the rabbit trails very far before you find the person that I'm, this person knows this person, and I'm connected to that person, and I know that person, and it's just, it's, it's amazing to me how all of that works, and all of that works because we have a common faith in, uh, in, in Jesus, and so I'm just, I'm just thankful to be part of that family. I hope you are too. Don't ever let Terry White uh, <clears throat> set your lunch appointment. Today, she had a lunch appointment for me with her friend Mindy, who I had met previously down in Louisville. I had a meeting down there, and Terry brought, Mindy's a coworker, and brought her down there, and I got to meet Mindy. And so she set up this lunch today, and it was a wonderful downtown Columbus at this little place, Z Zipporah's or what? Z Zahara? Zahara codes. I started with Z, that's all I know. And I had a hard time finding a place to park. I finally find a place to park two blocks away. Walk. I get there right on time. She's nowhere to be found. I get there right on time. Closed. It's closed on Mondays and Tuesdays. So that, that was a great joke. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was really funny. <laughs> Terry's, Terry and uh, my wife Julie are going on a cruise next week down to the Bahamas, and uh, David's going on a cruise over to Ohio <laughs> to work, and I'm going on a cruise. I'm staying home keeping the dog. So, as David says, we weren't, we didn't get the invite to go. So, that's kind of our exotic week plans. But we'll send them on their, on their way. Turn to Second Corinthians seven and verse one. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. <clears throat> Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit. And this is what I want you to mark in your Bibles. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Some translations render that, let us perfect holiness out of reverence for God. What does that mean? And how does that apply to the subject we're going to talk about tonight? And that's sacred marriage. So I'm going to begin with this fictitious story. A guy by the name of Greg walks to his car. He hits the button on the keypad to unlock the door, and nothing happened. He hit it again, and nothing happened. Now, he was able to take the key and get into the vehicle manually, the old-fashioned way, and when he did, the car wouldn't start. And the gas gauge read empty, even though he had just filled it up that morning. In fact, Greg began to notice nothing in the vehicle was working properly. In fact, the car had to be towed to a dealership. So the mechanic comes back with a diagnosis and says to him, Greg, you've got a bad BCM. It stands for the Basic Control Module of the Vehicle. It's like the brain of your car. And if that goes bad, everything's going to go bad. Nothing's going to, nothing's going to work. Now, Greg could have insisted, no, I want you to fix my remote control. I want you to fix my door locks. I want you to fix my gas gauge. I want you to fix everything in the car that's not working. But Greg was smart enough to figure out 
that if they replace the basic control module, then everything else would work as it should. I wonder sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to marriage, I wonder sometimes how often we just focus on the symptoms instead of the basic control module. So here's a young couple and they come in and they say, you hear things like this, we need to improve communication. Okay, but that's a symptom. Another couple comes in and they say, we need to get better at handling conflicts, conflict resolution. Okay, but that's a symptom. Another couple says, we need to show more affection to one another. We need to show more appreciation to one another. Okay, but that is a symptom. And we can spend all of our time on all of the symptoms when really our main focus needs to be on the basic control module. And the basic control module for a Christian is a spiritual focus it is a spiritual motivation. It is 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. Let us perfect holiness out of reverence for God. I don't know what you think that means. I'll tell you what I think that means. I think that means God comes first in every part of your life. Is marriage, is marriage exempt from that truth? Or is marriage included in that truth? You see, it all comes down to this. Either I am going to work to be a God-centered spouse, or I'm going to become a spouse-centered spouse. A spouse-centered spouse acts nice toward her husband, as long as he acts nice towards her. A spouse-centered spouse will go out of his way for his wife as long as she remains agreeable and affectionate. But does it ever occur to us that God demands more from us, from his people? And Paul says it right there in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. We are to perfect holiness because we reverence, we fear, we love God. In other words, the number one motivating factor in everything we do, including this very special, albeit brief, earthly relationship called marriage, the number one motivating factor in all that we do in that is reverence for God. You see, I'm not called to love and serve my wife because she's holier than anybody else. I'm not called to love and serve my wife because she always makes me happy. I am not called to love and serve my wife because things between us are always wonderfully ooey and gooey and romantic. <laughs> I am called to love and serve my wife out of reverence for God, period. That's 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. So every decision I make, every behavior I have, every attitude I manifest has to flow from that singular motivation. Is this something that brings honor to God? Now, we can go through life and work on just treating symptoms putting band-aids on symptoms. Or we can make a decision that says, I'm going to work on the basic control module. And I tell you, if you fix the basic control module, all this other stuff will start working the way God wants it to work. If you Google marriage quotes, there are thousands. So I'm going to give you my all-time favorite. Here it is. Remember Socrates? 
Remember studying Socrates in school? Okay, Socrates has my all-time favorite marriage quote. By all means, get married. If you get a good wife, you'll be happy. If you get a bad wife, you'll become a philosopher. There you go. You ever wondered why God hasn't designed this marriage thing to be easier than it is? It sounds easy. When you're on the outside looking in, it looks easy. Julie went to a wedding and and they're going through the reception receiving line and you know everybody's hugging the bride and all that kind of deal and Julie finally gets up there and hugs Lisa and Lisa looks at Julie and Lisa says that the bride says oh i'm just so thankful the hard parts over <laughs> and my wife takes her takes her in her hand her head in her hands and she said sweetheart are you in there <laughs> The hard part's over. <laughs> you ever watch one of these Hallmark movies? Guys, keep your hands down because that's not the macho thing, so we don't want to have to admit that. <laughs> Any of you ever watch the Hallmark movie? Here's a spoiler. Who said yes? Spoiler, so close your ears. Spoiler alert. They're all the same. Four things. This beautiful couple meets under improbable conditions. They fall in love. They fall out of love. In the last ten minutes, they fall back in love. And if it's a holiday Hallmark, you know, Christmas Hallmark, which runs from July to June, they kiss at the end of the movie, and it snows every time. They're all the same. And they make it look really easy. But you know and I know it's not that easy. Now let me tell you why it's not that easy. It's not that easy because romantic love, as we tend to define romantic love, romantic love has very little elasticity. When you start stretching romantic love, as we tend to define romantic love, instead of stretching, it shatters because romantic love tends to be all about me. What are you doing to make me happy? But mature love, holy love, God kind of love, stretches and stretches and stretches farther than anybody thinks it can. It has to. Because when you have two sinful people and two selfish people and they start living together as one, there's going to be trouble unless... Each is committed to a higher motivation, and that's reverence for God. You ever think maybe God has a higher purpose for matrimony than two people sharing the same mailbox or sharing the same kitchen table or sharing the same bedroom? Do you ever think maybe God has a higher purpose for that? And that, that higher purpose may not be what a lot of people think it is. It may not be your happiness he has in mind, but your holiness he has in mind. Now, I'm not saying when you get married, happiness runs over here and holiness runs over here. They're mutually exclusive. I'm not saying that. Here's what I'm saying. When you look at your relationship through the lens of God's perspective, you begin to understand there's a bigger purpose in it. And for this marriage to work as God wants it to work, I've got to come to the turn. It's not about me. So what's the purpose? What's the purpose behind this intense, one-on-one, -on -one, lifelong relationship? What's the real purpose? And I'll tell you what it is. It's to draw both of us closer to the one who brought us together. Think about a triangle with God at the apex. Do you know that the closer I get in my relationship to God and the closer she gets in her relationship to God, guess what happens? 
the closer we become to one another. And it all goes back to God being the centerpiece of it all. And I'll tell you why that's really important, essential. Because my relationship with God is going to outlast my relationship with my spouse. My relationship with my spouse is that long. My relationship with God is forever. That's why just working on the symptoms aren't going to work very well in the long run if that's all it is. Now, you can try to make your home more peaceful and pleasant. Yes, do that. You can look for ways to keep the romance alive. Yes, do that. You can show respect to one another and courtesy and kindness and politeness and all that. Yes, do all of those things. But if your relationship with God isn't what it ought to be, are we not just treating symptoms? It'll never get right until you get God right. Until you get God right. Now the problem is sometimes we look for something in another human being that ultimately and eternally only God can provide. I think that's why marriage dissatisfaction runs so high. Marriage dissatisfaction runs so high because, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes I think we expect too much. It's like trying to run today's computer programs on an old 486 computer. Does anybody remember those? Anybody have a four? You used to have a four? I used to have a 486 computer. I think back in the 80s. Remember the floppies? Okay. Um, we were. We were. I don't remember where it was. Uh, we were. We're in Washington, D.C., and we're going through the his, history, the American History Museum in Smithsonian, and we're going through there, and they, they had opened up a new exhibit about technology, and we're going through there, and uh, I think Luke was with us. He was our last one. I think he was a teenager. And we're, going, we're, looking, we're going through there, and he goes, Hey, Dad, look! It's your computer! <laughs> Smart, Alec. You know you're getting old when your stuff shows up in a Smithsonian, you know? The old 486 computer was not a bad computer. It was top of the line in its day. But you can't take today's programs and run it on an old 486. It's not going to work. It's not that the machine is bad. You're just now, I'm asking the machine to do more than it is capable of doing. And I wonder sometimes if that's not what happens in marriage. If I'm seeking the largest proportion of my life fulfillment from my spouse, if that's where, if that's where I get the largest proportion of my life fulfillment, then I'm asking too much. Because ultimately I was created and you were created with an eternal craving for a relationship with the Creator Himself. What is it that the book of Ecclesiastes says? He has set eternity in their heart. Who has? God has. And your wife isn't God. And your husband isn't God. Only God can fill that space. Only God. And when you finally get that, the basic control module, then and only then will you have a new appreciation for this person with whom you have embarked upon this earthly journey. Do you ever go through the Bible and think about how many times Scripture connects God's relationship with His people to marriage? He does it all the time, Old Testament, New Testament. We can spend the rest of our time tonight and probably more just looking at verses that do that. Isaiah 62 and verse 5, As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so God rejoices over you. He puts it in terms of marriage because we can understand that. Matthew 9, 15, Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom. Matthew 22, verse 1, he compares the kingdom of heaven to a wedding banquet. 
Revelation 19, 7, the wedding of the Lamb. He talks about the bride has made herself ready. And what is the church called? The bride of Christ. And in the Old Testament, the breakdown of spiritual fidelity between God and Israel is couched in the terms of marital infidelity. Passages like Jeremiah 3 and verse 8, I gave Israel her divorce and I sent her away because of her adultery. But perhaps no place is the sacredness of marriage seen with greater clarity than in Ephesians 5. Where holy matrimony is compared to the holy union between Jesus and the church. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 22, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all of her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and he cherishes it as Christ does the church. For this reason, a man shall leave father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. How can you read verses like that and not understand how God puts the holy in matrimony, where God puts the sacred in marriage? And yet so oftentimes we go to verses like this, we go to passages like this, and we just want to kind of pick out one little thing or two little things and ignore the, the contextual setting of the whole passage. For example, I'll tell you how we do it. One, one way we do it. For example, verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. And we talk a lot about submission. Do you understand in the Ephesians 5 passage, do you understand there's an A part to submission? And there is a B part to submission, and there is a C part to submission. You ever notice this? That the A part doesn't start in verse 22. The A part starts in verse 21. When he says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. I'll tell you what that is. That's mutual submission, one to another. In, in every relationship, mutual submission. Does that work in the home? Yeah, it does. I don't think marriage is excluded out of verse 21. I think it's included in that. There's times in which I submit to my wife because there's areas of life she knows a lot more about than I do. And so I give way to her judgment. I give way to her opinion. I mutually submit to that because I'm thinking she's She's better. She knows more about that than I do. And then there's times when she does the same thing to me. Mutual submission there. And the B part is in verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. God is a God of order, not chaos. In everything God touches, there is order. Beginning in Genesis, when God created the heavens and the earth, there is order. And we see that order every single day. The universe is not out of order, it's very much in order. And then when it comes to the governments and the rulings and the authorities of men, God has order for that too. Read Romans chapter 13. When it comes to the church, there's order there. Shepherds in every congregation. We understand how all of that works. When it comes to the home, there's order there. And that's where verse 22 comes in. But the C part helps us understand how all this works. Verse 25, husbands love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. What's the role of the husband? It's the role of Christ. What's the role of Christ? 
to serve and sacrifice. To serve and sacrifice. My job as a husband is to sacrifice for my wife. My job as a husband is to serve her needs and put her first. That's what Jesus does for his people. And I will tell you, when a husband treats his wife like Jesus, who would not want to be in submission to that? You ever looked at the word submission? If you're taking notes, write down the word sub submission. Write it down. And then after the prefix sub, draw a slash line. Because the prefix sub is a, is a prefix. The word sub, prefix sub, means under. A submarine is an underwater vehicle. A subordinate is somebody under the authority of another. And so when we talk about sub, we're talking about under mission. We understand what mission is all about. We talk about it Sunday night. So we understand what submission is all about. What he's saying is oh, the wife should be in sub under mission of the husband. What is the mission of the husband? That's the real question. What is the mission of a husband who love his wife and serve and sacrifice for her and put her first like Jesus did the church. That's my mission. That's my mission. But how can we read passages like this and not understand the sacredness, the sacredness of this relationship? Or in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 9, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 9. Paul says, Therefore, we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. What's my life ambition? What is my life goal? To be pleasing to Him. So let me ask you a question about verse 9. Is marriage uh, excluded from that? Or is marriage included in them? The first purpose of marriage, even beyond sexual expression, even beyond the bearing of children, even beyond even companionship, is not what most people think it is. It's not my happiness. That's not what it's about. I think of 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Is marriage excluded from that or is marriage included in that? And if that's not enough, look at verse 15, 2 Corinthians 5, 15. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves. Look at that. No longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Is marriage exempt from that? God is demanding that I look at my life and the relationship that I have with my spouse through the lens of his perspective. And God is telling me, my marriage is not about my happiness and my glory. My marriage is about bringing honor to him. And that's what it's all about. Come on down to verse 18. Another verse. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation. I think Paul is specifically talking about the great commission God gave the apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But let me ask you this question about the ministry of reconciliation. It's not the very message of the gospel. It's not the very work of the church. Really, the ministry of reconciliation? What's our job? To share the good news of Jesus? And how that through Jesus, man can be reconciled to God because of the cross? You say, what does that have to do with marriage? This reconciled, what does that have to do with marriage? All right, answer me a question. When two people stand before a judge because they've decided to call it quits, what's the number one reason usually given?
irreconcilable differences. Irreconcilable differences. Interesting. Because if our homes are fraught with fighting and animosity and distrust and anger and resentment, guess what's just happened? My marriage has contradicted the gospel message. And if my marriage contradicts the gospel message, I have sabotaged the goal of my life. Because the goal of my life is twofold. To live pleasing to Him, verse 9, and to share the message of reconciliation to other people. And a marriage that is God-honoring will put flesh on the picture of what reconciliation is all about. Because a marriage that is God-honoring will model forgiveness and selfless love and sacrifice. What do you think are the basics of reconciliation? What I'm saying is what we do for one another as husbands and wives when it comes to forgiveness and selfless love and sacrifice is nothing but a tiny taste of what God does for you and for me. Your marriage will either be a stumbling block or a stepping stone to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, there's an exception to that. In Romans 12 and verse 18, Paul says, as far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Sometimes you learn a very hard lesson in life, and that is there's only one person you can control. Only one. And that's you. And if you have a spouse who is bound and determined to be morally unfaithful, do you understand what you can do to stop that? Do you understand what you can do about that? Nothing. If they're determined to be morally unfaithful, there's not anything you can do about it. And Jesus talks about that in passages like Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9, where God allows unfaithfulness to break the bond of holy matrimony and the innocent one to put the guilty one away. But I would add this, not as a first response, but as a last result. I had a lady tell me one time, she said, oh, I just don't think there's any such thing as an innocent party. Well, Take that up with Jesus. But secondly, what she really means is there's no such thing as a perfect party. And that's true. But it's not about perfection. It never is. It's about glorifying God in my life. And it's about asking and answering one question. What would God want me to do? And yet sometimes that may mean making a very hard decision, especially when spiritual lives and sometimes young lives hang in the balance. Because I'll tell you something about reconciliation that we sometimes don't think about. Do you understand at the core of reconciliation is this thing called repentance? Repentance. John the baptizer told us about repentance. Repentance is more than saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is showing you're sorry by the fruit you bear. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 8. By the fruit you will know them. And sometimes it takes a while to bear fruit. If you, you understand the seasons of the year and you understand that it takes a while to bear. But at the core of reconciliation is always going to be repentance, true repentance. And repentance is more than words. I say all of that to say that we live in a culture, we live in a society, 
in which relationships are just discarded with frightening regularity. And people don't keep their promises. And spouse bashing becomes a favorite pastime. But you contrast that to Christians who work really hard at maintaining a God-glorifying relationship. And when that happens, those people command attention. Because our lives and our marriages and our relationships become platforms for the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And through our lives, and through our behaviors and attitudes and the way we treat one another, we either can lead others to Him, or we can push them away. How many of you have been married 30 years, at least 30 years? 40? 50? 80? <laughs> I was at a place one time and I said, I did the 50, and this guy, he's sitting on the back row. Brother Locke Miller, he's sitting back there. I said, 50, and he raised it. I said, 60, he raised it. 70, 80, 90, 100. He kept raising it. He raised his hand at 100. And I said, I said, I said brother, you've been married 100 years? He said, no, but it sure feels like it. <laughs> and I thought, I don't want to be in his car on the way home. You know, it's easy for younger people to look at people who've been married 30, 40, 50, 60 years, it's easy for younger people to look at people who've been married a long time and think, well, they had it easy. They had it easy. They didn't have it easy. They had it hard, just like everybody else. But the reason they're married 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years is a testimony to reconciliation. It's a testimony to forgiveness and selfless love and sacrifice. Let me leave you with one more thought. That when you marry a Christian, your spouse is not just your spouse. Your spouse is God's son. Your spouse is God's daughter. Your spouse is God's child. And you can understand that if you want to get on the good side of parents, you be good to their kids. You want to get on the bad side of a parent, start picking on them. Be a bully. Be mean. And you're going to fire a parental righteous indignation very quickly. Don't you think it's the same with God? Zechariah 2 and verse 8, God said, He who touches you touches the apple of my eye. So I need to remember that I married God's child. So it's not about me and my attitude toward this person over here. It's about me and my attitude toward a daughter of God. And I'll give you one more thing to think about. We talk about the, the analogy of the fatherhood of God. Jesus said when you pray for our Father who art in heaven. Okay. If God is the Father of the woman you married. Do you understand what that makes him to you? He's your father-in-law. And when you fail to treat your wife as you should, and you speak demeaningly to her, mistreat her, speak condescendingly to her, you're going to court trouble with your father-in-law, guaranteed. 1 Peter 3 and verse 7 says, You show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. That is a powerful statement to us husbands. You know, as a father, I pray that my kids will have spouses who will love them dearly, like I love them. But every one of my kids fall short. Not one of them's perfect. All of my kids have quirks. And all of my kids have limitations. And all of my kids have faults. I know that because their daddy does. So, I pray that they will have a spouse who will be kind and forgiving 
and patient. I would cringe to think they would be married to someone who would be cruel to them or who would abuse them in some way or mistreat them in some way. Now, God is fully aware that your spouse has limitations. God is fully aware that your spouse has faults. God is fully aware that your spouse has failures, quirks, whatever you want to call them. So here's the deal. He wants you to be as forgiving and patient with them as we would want our kids' spouses to be with them. So think about how you've been treating your spouse. Is that how you want your daughter treated by her spouse? Is that how you want your son treated by his spouse? You didn't just marry this any man, any woman. You married a son of God. You married a daughter of God, a child of God. And he's watching every day how you treat his special child. If that doesn't sober us about our relationship, I don't know what it would tell you. I don't remember the occasion. There was one. I took the day off and Luke and I went, went golfing and Julie said, when you guys get back, I'm going to have this big dinner. We're going to, we're going to celebrate right, and, and we're going to have this, oh, I'm going to do it upright. You guys go have fun. Go golf, have fun. So we went out golfing. <clears throat> we come back. I mean, she's got this, oh, fantastic dinner, and we're all enjoying all of that. And we get through, and she says, I've made, I've made your favorite. I've made, a, I've made a chocolate pie. And I looked over there on the counter, and there's this pie, and it looks fake. I mean, the meringue on that thing is whipped up. I mean, it just looked like something out of a magazine. And I thought, man, that's going to be great, you know? And so we clear away the dishes, and she takes and cuts a piece and puts it in front of me. She goes back to cut Luke a piece. Now, you have to understand something about Julie. She is big on manners. She has taught us all that when you, they're serving you dessert, don't just start digging in. Wait till the hostess sits down or the hostess gives you permission. So I'm looking at this piece of chocolate pie and I'm thinking, oh man. So when her back was to me, I took the tip of my fork and I dipped it in a little of chocolate and I put it on my tongue. Because that doesn't count. And I got to tell you, that was the worst stuff I'd ever put in my mouth. It was horrible. And I realized she didn't put any sugar in this. It's like eating baked cocoa out of a can. It was gross. It was gross. And I started to say something. And I thought, no, no, no. I got a teenage boy sitting right here. And when she says to dig in, he's going to dig in. I'm going to watch the show. And she said, oh, wait, eat, eat, eat. And so I just sat there and looked over at him. And he got his fork. He got him a big piece and stuck it in his mouth. And all of a sudden, you start seeing the cheeks get really big and the red going up his face and the sweat. And, and the next thing I know, there's this chocolate explosion. <sighs> and Julie's just mortified. What, 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 what's going on? What? And she takes a bite and she goes, oh, no, no. and she realized immediately what she did. And she grabs my plate, she grabs his plate, and she says, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And I grabbed the plates back from her, and I put his plate down, and I put my plate down. She said, you're not going to eat this. And I looked at Luke, and I said, do exactly what I do. And I took my fork, and I scraped off the meringue. And I'm here to tell you, my wife makes the best meringue pie you've ever eaten. <laughs> Marriage is like that. Not every day is going to be sweet. In fact, some days are going to be bitter. Some days are going to be hard. 
And that's when you eat the meringue and like it. May God help us to show the gospel of Jesus Christ through this relationship that he has given to us. And to those of you who have lost mates, who have passed on, and I know several of you have, thank you for your example. Because other, other eyes have been watching you. And we appreciate so much your faith and your love and the example that you have set for all of us. We sing the song of invitation tonight. If you're not a Christian, and it's interesting also to study Scripture and to look at the family terminology that he uses so often. Born again? Think about it. You can be born again into the family of God. You're born into a physical family. You can be born into the family of God. You can become a Christian. You can be baptized for the remission of your sins. What a day. What, a, what an event that would be. And if we can help you tonight, please come. Always.